Hello and welcome to episode 94 of This Week in BJJ. Today is November 5th. On today's show, I'm going to talk a little bit about EBI 5, a few new geese from Tatami, a viewer email, and then an interview and techniques with Legarto. December 13th, EBI 5 is going to be coming back to the Orpheum Theater in downtown LA, and again, we're going to be providing you with a live coverage. If you've seen any of the other EBIs, you know that they are super exciting. It's the only event where you're almost guaranteed a submission in every single match. In this event, EBI 5, it's going to be a 16-man lightweight division with a maximum $20,000 possible in the cash prize. And there's going to be three super fights. Here are some of the names of the lightweights competing. We got Denny Prokopos, Nathan Orchard, Ronnie Yaya, Eddie Cummings, Dan Covell, Barrett Yoshida, and a bunch more. For more information, just go to budovideos.com slash EBI5. Okay, time for new products. There are three new geese that I want to bring to your attention today. These are all by Tatami Fightwear. These are the Estilo 5.0, an update to the very popular Estilo line of geese. First we have the white on white, then the black on black, and finally the white with camo. Now all these geese are 550 grams, which is a pretty lightweight, not too heavy, not too light. Very durable and comfortable. 12 ounce canvas pants and embroidery all around. Really nice looking geese in a variety of sizes, including the large and extra large sizes. Some of the ones with the longer sleeves, wider torsos. Check them out on budovideos.com. I think you're going to like them. Okay, now time for viewer email. Okay, today's mail comes from KL. He writes, after three years of no-gi training, I'm just starting to train in the gi, and I need to learn some tricky lapel chokes quick. Do you have a DVD recommendation? Well, first of all, thank you, KL, for the mail. And if you have a question that you uh, would like me to answer, just send it to TWIBJJ at BudoVideos.com. So lapel, uh, lapel work and collar work is, uh, is something that is difficult when you're making the transition from no-gi to gi. And... Um, but it's one of those things, just like anything, that you can learn uh, without too much effort. And uh, there are a couple DVDs that I'll recommend. Keith Owen was on uh, Twibbage uh, a few, a couple months ago, and he shared some really nice lapel work. He has two DVDs called Lights Out. One is uh, Lights Out Volume 1 and Lights Out Volume 2. Now on Lights Out Volume 1, Keith color, uh, covers lapel, uh, excuse me, collar chokes. Collar meaning the part of the gi up here. On volume two, he covers lapel chokes, which is the, the end of the, the lapel, the end of the gi, which he'll use to wrap around and use that for chokes. So if you use both of them together, you'll get a good system of chokes using the gi. And um, if you want to check out a little sampling of that, check out Twibbage episode number 82. That was the one that Keith Owen was on, and he showed some of his, uh, his work there. And um, just pay particular attention to how he passes the lapel over. It's really interesting, uh, something that I've never seen anybody else teach. So uh, thank you again for the mail. And again, twibbage at buddhavideos.com is the email address if you have a question. Okay, now it's time for an interview and techniques by Lucio Rodriguez, better known as Lagarto. He has a school in England he is a Gracie Baja black belt under Carlos Gracie Jr. He's an active competitor, and he is a cancer survivor. He has a great story. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Here we go. Agarto, thanks for coming on the show. Hello, Brad. Welcome. And, uh, man, it's your birthday today. I yes. didn't know it until you came here and told me, but uh, happy birthday. Thank you're, you very uh, much. 35 Thank years old today, right? Yes, 25. 25. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, but you've never, this is your first time to America. Um, why did it take you so long to visit America? Well, I have my visa, the guys denied my visa eight times, you know, and, you know, finally I got my, my visa, and, you know, I came over. It was, was a long road to do that. Mm. You know, the guys denied it, and I, you know, I just looking for the lawyers, you know, to do this. I'm looking for the best lawyer for UK, mm. uh, like loan to help for you, and they managed to do it. 
Wow. So getting denied eight times, did you do something really bad, or is that a common situation for Brazilians trying to come to America? No. I think it was the time, the first time I tried to, to get my visa was in the, when I had the problem with the World Trade Center. And after then, the guys just, after that, the guys just tried, you know, one after the other. I think it was easier, the procedure, you know? Mm -hmm. The guys look, oh, look at the history of this guy. You know, just, that's the night, the night, the night, you know? And I had the, the had the, I mean, that was really funny because I was, every time I have the worlds, I was at home so disappointed, man. And one day I think, man, I need to find the best lawyer, you know, to gonna help. Who's the best lawyer? Then I was watching the TV and came like Francine Mendonça, like, she, you know, talk on the TV all the time. I said, her, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I go her, I gotta try to catch her, you know. And then she said, look, Luz, when you get it there, you cannot let the guy open the screen. You cannot let the guy see your life because the guy's gonna deny it straight away again. You have to take his attention, you know. So as soon as I got there, the guy, I, okay, uh, good morning, I say, good morning, sir. I don't wanna rent the suit again, so I need 20 seconds of my life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then he laughed, you know, then he said, okay, how can I help you? Then I explained him, look, my life changed so much for the last years. And then this year, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my passport, the British passport, you know. And I have the business, my name, everything. I just wanna go to America, see my friends, catch some waves, you know, and that's it. And I come back, I just need two weeks. Mm -hmm. Welcome to America. Boom. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, you know, I think um, maybe I take it for granted being that we're so close to the Long Beach Pyramid, we can always go whenever we want, but there's a lot of people in your similar situation that due to visa issues or financial reasons can't come to compete, so yeah, I'll have to keep that in mind. Yeah. So um, before we get into some of your background on training, how did you get stuck with the nickname Lagarto, <laughs> Lizard? <laughs> yes, uh, um, that was Mars Feitosa's idea, you know? He looked at me one day, he was trying to say, man, this guy, he looks like an animal, but I don't really know what it looks like. It's some, I don't know, reptile or whatever. And the guy decided the lagarto. You know, now the guys think school have the nickname as a lagarto, but when you are teenage and the people call you lagarto, you know, in the front of the girls, not really fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's got, I was feeling really bad, but now, to be honest, I like it, you know, even my dad called me lagarto. Mm. So yeah, Marcio is really good at giving nicknames. Yeah, terrible, yes. <laughs> terrible, yeah, because he even told me one time that only the bad nicknames stick. And, you know, yes, of course. Some, some guys with terrible nicknames in Gracie Baja, guys that if, if you don't speak Portuguese, you think, oh, that's just his name, Cabeça, okay. Yeah, but Cabeça. Big yeah. head. Yeah, right. <laughs> Arroz, you right. know, the people think Arroz is a nice nickname. <laughs> no, Arroz basically is the guy who always walks for the girls, but he never, you know, catch the girls because, mm -hmm. like, you know, you never eat just rice. Right. You need to eat uh, rice for some things. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about uh, growing up and uh, training in Gracie Baja. It's amazing, man. Training in Gracie Baja was, you know, the... I'm so blessed, you know, trained up in Gracie Baja. I learned so much, you know. Uh, I know just about the Jiu-Jitsu. That time was amazing to, to have, you know, all my heroes on the mat and they could train for all these guys. But to see the, you know, to be a champ, have to be in the middle of the champions. And I learned so much for the guys, how the guys think, you know, how the guys eat. That time, you know, the guys was, you know, teaching, speaking English. I was like, wow, man, this guy is another level, you know? So I'm really grateful uh, for Grace Barra, you know, for my master, Carlos Grace, to have this amazing view to spread the Jiu-Jitsu around the world. You know, I believe, you know, because Carlos Grace, today, you know, a lot of people, you know, can live from the Jiu-Jitsu because of him, mm -hmm. because of Grace Bar. The people don't really realize it, but uh, that's true. And I'm so glad I managed to, to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, both of, both of us were promoted by, by Carlos Gracie Jr. And a lot of people in the jiu-jitsu world know about his, his business accomplishments, you know, his, his, yes. his great efforts at spreading uh, the IBGF tournaments and, and Gracie Ba, of course, but not a lot of people know about how he is on the mats. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about how your training was with Carlos. It was amazing. Carlos, he always, uh, he was not the guy who's going to teach you 100 techniques, but he's the guy who, once he pulled his red chair, sit on the chair and cross his legs and say time, that was worse than the world championship, you know? 
we want to give the best, we want to show him what you can do it. And after that, he came and said, okay, how do you do that move? Show me. And then the other guy came, another black belt, look, I can stop like this, okay, show me, you know? He was like, always support us, you know? Uh, he, make, he came with the ideas, you know, to help us to improve. That was amazing, you know? He have this, this power, he, you know? He make you think you were teaching him, but in the end, he's teaching you. You know what I mean? Mm. It's amazing the, the way how I learned so much. And of course, he have his right arm, Massive Feitosa, you know, super technical, always there teaching, you know. So it was amazing environment. You know, I was, you know, that time in the Grace Bar in Rio de Janeiro, it was, was uh, something I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep in my heart for the rest of my life, right. the rest of my life. Can you think of any particular lessons that Carlos taught you? Yes, uh, I remember one time, just before a fight against uh, Ronaldo Jacaré, he told me, uh, and actually was not even on the mat, was uh, we're going to Pedro da Gave, we walking, you know, climbing the Pedro da Gave. He <laughs> used to ask me to wake him up, you know, so we can go together. And then we, we went to Pedro Agave and he said, Lagarto, listen, I'm gonna fight for this guy, he's a year on the brown belt, uh, killing people, you know, because he's supposed to win the world, he didn't win, he lost to Roger, and now he, you know, you're gonna fight against this guy. What I have to do is, uh, don't think about points, you know, go for submission all the time. Every position you see, go for submission. Every position. Because if you try to play strategically for this guy, you know, he's competing a lot. Nobody scored even one advantage on this guy for the whole year, you know, go to compete, you know. And before I step on the mat, when I saw the crowd, you know, singing against me, you know, uh, was funny. You know, all the guys from Tereré mm -hmm. singing. I was Joel Azul, Playboyzinho. De olho azul e anelzinho, o lagarto é um tremendo playboyzinho. The guy was say I was playboy, the guy have this idea for Gracie Bar, mm -hmm. because from Barra da Tijuca, such a nice neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So the guy used to say I was a playboy. So I just keep the, the words of my master, you know, to go submission, you know. And, you know, that was something that I, I learned a lot, you know, since then, every time when I train, I try to see one submission for every position, you know, and that helps a lot. And of course, all the details he taught me, you know, from the mount, you know, details from the knees, details how, man, it's unbelievable. Yeah, he really is a fantastic teacher. Yes. And that's, you know, all the stuff you mentioned was on the ground. His stand-up teaching is amazing too. Yes, unbelievable. Yes, it's great, great point. I remember one time he was teaching some uh, stand-up details. Wow, it was mm -hmm. so, so nice. Yeah. But getting back to your match with Jacare, I, I don't recall how it went. Did you? How did it go? Did you at least score Man, an advantage? Yes, it was for, that was so interesting because for so many years, for, for a whole year, nobody scored even one advantage in Jacare. And he used to finish the mats, he even didn't break his sweat, mm. you know? He finished all the mats like this. And I was the whole year thinking about him, you know? I have his picture in my room. And I thought, man, I'm gonna, you know? And I was fighting, having such a lot of tough guys before him. But I was so determined to fight against him, you know. And then when I got on the on the final, I swept him. I swept him. I pulled guard, I swept, and uh, actually I swept him three times. But Jefferson Moura was calling. He was shouting for me, and he said, "You winning? You winning by points? Take your time. Take your time." And I thought I was winning, and but actually Jacare was winning by two points. It was crazy points. The referee was giving points. It was very hard fight. And was the first time I remember that was so cool. Was the first time the people saw Jacare asking about the time, mm. how long left. Mm. You know, that fight was when the world started to know about Lagarto. You know, was it 2006? It was 2000, 2003. Oh wow! So you know, then the that thought I was winning. You can see in the fight when finish the fight, I celebrate. I was like, mm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> quack, 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 you know. 
but I was because the score was crazy, and even my friend also he thought I was winning, you know. And yeah, I managed to sweep him three times. He went for for a choke, bar and arrow choke, and I didn't tap. I escaped, and eventually I escaped and swept him again. But once he came to the top of the scrum, and he comes to the top and passed straight away, so it was crazy. Mm. It was a great fight. Jaka is a tough guy. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so somehow you ended up in Portugal and England. Uh, how did you end up in those places? Yes. When I, when I went to Portugal, because Carlinhos asked me to go, Carlos Grace asked me to go to start the Jiu-Jitsu there, to start to spread the Grace Barra there. And I went to there, I started you know, to teach, I started, you know, but uh, that was far away for what I want, you know. Then imagine, 22 years old boy, I went European, my ways and open division. But I, I, I try to apply my visa from there to America. I got my, I think, third deny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I, I realized I, I, I have to move. And then when I come to, when I try to come to, just to live in London, they end up going to north of the UK. And I remember have like 50 pounds. That was all my money. And I call a friend of mine, it's called Ben Popleton. And I said, Ben, man, because I thought I'd be able to stay for Roger, but Roger would have his commitment, was so hard, you know, that I said, well, I have to do something, you know, I will not come back. They called his friend, he's an English guy, you know, and his family supports me so much. And I was leaving his house, and his dad, Roy Popleton, he used to call people to come for his house to do privates. Mm. So he put the mats on the, ups, you know, on the top of his house, and he was, man, he was like a, my PA who organizes it. <laughs> and I didn't speak any English that time, you know. So it was Roy to, trying to be my translator. It mm -hmm. was so funny. The guys helped me so much. And these guys, you know, they start to, the people start to know me, you know, eventually. Then Matt, a uh, guy called Paul Hartley. He's my first black belt. And Paul Hartley, you know, uh, invited me to go to press. And I, I started teaching press north of UK. Today we have the Grace Barra Press on there, and then we, and then from there I was they had the problem and all this. Then eventually Roger invited me to go to to London, mm -hmm. and then me and Roger worked for two years, and then I opened my own school, Grace Barra Fulham. So now there's uh, three of the best Grace Barra instructors in the world with you, Roger, and Braulio. Oh, thank and, you, uh, thank you to hear that. Yeah, that's true. We all the time we you know we try to train as much we can. And you know we help a lot of each other. To be honest, beef Roger these two years, I think I was. It's funny because me and Roger grow up together, you know. But uh, I had the chance. To, I, say, I like to say this to get all the grace details, mm -hmm. you know. Is the I had the chance to when I was there working for with Roger to train with him every day. I got a lot. My jiu jitsu improves a lot, you know especially from the top, you know, I got a, I, I learned so much. I mean, you know, really glad for this guy. Not just about the Jiu-Jitsu, but everything he helped me, you know. I'm in London today because of him, you know. He went to, to Preston, I was there, and I just, I just came from the European, and I was feeling so sick. I thought, you know, the problem come back, I thought the cancer just come back, and then, I just find out I was with pneumonia. 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 And then I said, okay, I got to come to London, let's do it. You know, then I was leaving his house for a while, you know. And, you know, he was, he was a great friend, you know, it was a big thing to do. I'm really glad.